Amen. How wonderful. How wonderful. My, my. This morning, I want, to, um, I want to talk to you about God's call, His stamp, His desire for you, His wanting and longing for you and you alone. And um, th- this morning, I want to talk to you about God's hand upon your life. Thank you all so much for your kindness and your patience with me. Tonight, we will be at Tri-City Assembly, just down the road. We're all going to be there. It starts at 6 o'clock tonight. And uh, Sunday through Wednesday night, I'm preaching Wednesday night. There's different ones that will be preaching each night, uh, different pastors. And we're all gathering for a community service there at uh, Tri-City Assembly. It's just up the road. And... um, I think Roy's preaching tonight. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, it's out on the board. And I, as sure as I try to do it. So there won't be anything here Wednesday night. There won't be anything here so- tonight, okay? So make sure you go down there and you'll meet with us. Uh, someone suggested that we all wear yellow T-shirts. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, if you ever been to a Promise Keepers and, you know, one church will wear all the same color. and It's quite exciting. Okay. <laughs> all right. But we won't do that. We'll meet as a community and lift up the name of Jesus and uh, do our best to glorify God. Make sure that, uh, but by the way, today is Sanctity of Life Sunday, which is, by the way, the reason why we're going to be reading from this passage from the book of Psalm, chapter 139. On Sanctity of Life Sunday, no matter what is legal in our community or in our country, we believe that God honors all life. We believe that he is not only the author of life, but he is the one that guards over life, honors life. As a matter of fact, he's very careful about blood and bloodshed. If you read the scriptures, you don't have any problem with this. Because in the scriptures, he's very, very clear. As a matter of fact, you remember the very first murder that took place. It said that Abel's blood cries out from the ground. Don't you know that there is a scream from our nation as uh, literally multiplied millions are slaughtered? And uh, today, we we believe that God honors life. And this partial birth abortion is even more heinous than anything that the Nazis did. We condemn that, and I'll tell you what, and it should be. But I'll tell you what, we are practicing that partial birth abortion is... It's diabolical. It, it's, it's just beyond our imagination that you could take a live baby and, and call it legal, uh, legal to kill a child. I, that was my commentary. And I'll tell you what, we, we believe that God honors life. Today I want to talk to you about developing a keen awareness of God's call in your life. Do you realize whether you know it or not, many times you have a uniqueness about you that, other, that you don't even recognize yourself. There are people that, let let me just tell you and just kind of share my heart first and then we'll go, all right? I can't tell you how many times that there have been at the end of a person's life, there would be people that would come to the family and say, oh my, you you don't know what he meant to me or what she meant to me and would go through maybe a litany of things that they had done. Perhaps uh, it was just the phone calls that they made, or perhaps without anyone else knowing, that person made an impact on, on this individual's life. They told them and were getting ready to tell them and told the family too late. But it made a difference. It made an impact. Your lives are, are, make impacts on others. As a matter of fact, God's spirit inside of you makes you unique. As a matter of fact, he has put a call on your life, and, and the, the, the treasure that he has deposited within you is sacred, and it is precious. And far more than we sim- sometimes even honor. Most of the time, more than we even give honor or even lip service to, God's hand and his call is upon your life. Every person. As a matter of fact, I'm not just talking about people that, you know, are in church. I'm talking about those that Jesus died for that are still walking the streets. The Lord honors, and those are his children. 
He died for that whosoever will. If any man believe, he died for the one that is still cursing him. Your precious treasure in the eyes of God. Developing a keen awareness, I believe that we understand that we're created for fellowship with God, that, that everything that he created has purpose, and understanding our purpose will cause us to act differently. It will cause us to, to respond differently. It will cause us to, to have different attitudes, uh, even a, a, a different uh, habits and, and different pursuits. Different attitude, all of these things are an outgrowth of our purpose and what we feel is our purpose. Let me give you an illustration of that. If you don't believe it, if, if you walk into a home and you are the parent of that home, your, your concept, your paradigm is different than that child's that's there. Most of you, or many of you, are. Uh, there's a bunch of teachers. You know as well as I do, when you walk into a classroom and you are a teacher, it's totally different than when you're a student. When you walk in as a student, you know, you just kind of sit in the back and, and pop up your feet and go teach me if you can. <laughs> but when you go in with a different attitude, with a different purpose, with a different calling, you go with one intent to engage those people that are there, to, to impart to them. And, and I believe that it happens the same way when we live our lives and we just kind of live as the one that is a spectator. We prop up our feet in the back and we say, well, get me if you can. And all the time, God doesn't see that in you. He sees you as one that is called to be the answer, not part of the problem. Right, right. He has called you to be the ones that will make a difference in the world around us. He has called you to be a, a changer. Anybody can be a thermostat. A thermometer, rather, uh, you know, just one that's reporting. But a thermostat makes a difference in the room. You know, whenever you flip the, the thermostat on it, it cools it up or warms it, <laughs> cools it down, warms it up. There we go. I, I, I only get in trouble when I talk. It's okay. I believe that the, you are called to make a difference. Look with me, if you will, to the book of Psalm chapter 139. Psalm 139 on this this precious passage of Scripture. I want you to, to look with me. As a matter of fact, this might be a different version than most of you or than the, you might have there in your hands, but read with me if you will. Verse 13, it says, For you created my inmost being. This is the psalmist talking to God. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Listen to verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. All of my days were written before even one of them happened. You see, I believe that this, this passage of Scripture probably illustrates better than most the inner workings and the preciousness of life. Let's, let's first talk about our lives in general because I think we need to have an understanding of our lives. The very first thing is this. On your, on your outline there and on your paper this morning, I want you to, to, to follow along with me because it's a, it's a good understanding to get a foundation for, for why we believe this. You see, number one is this. God is the creator of all life. You, you say that we had a baby. You, you did only because God put within you the ability to do that. He takes those, God is the one. As a matter of fact, John chapter 1 says, all things that were made were made by him. He was the creator of, of all things. Nothing else happened. In the beginning, God created. Jeremiah 1 says that, that before I was formed, you, you knew me. God is the creator of all life. Everything, all of the miracle of the DNA that they discovered just, uh, what, 70 years ago, just a uh, reaffirmed the, the uniqueness and the preciousness of life. It recognized that there was a stamp and a, and a, and a putting together of the, of the chromosomes, unique in all the world. And you, your body, your life is unique, not unlike any other. 
We, we share this, this common image of God, but, but beyond that, every one of us have just a little bit of uniqueness about us. Not only is God the creator of all life, number two is this, all life is precious. Every life is precious. You need to get a hold of this because I guarantee you that there are people in this room that don't feel that way. I guarantee you that there have been somewhere along the line, somebody has fed you a lie or maybe you have, have felt like you didn't measure up. The book of Matthew, I was just reading it this week, and it says this, that aren't, aren't two sparrows sold for a penny or a farthing? Aren't they, aren't, aren't they cheap, in other words? But it says this, that not one of them falls to the ground without the Father knowing it. Not one of them. Every one of the lives, everything living is precious and sacred to God. He sees those. And he, if, a, if a sparrow, he sees a sparrow, how much more does he care for you? How much more does he care about your life? How much more are you precious in his sight? How much more do you count in the, in, in the economy of God? No matter your circumstance that you were born into, no matter your parents, whether they raised you or did not raise you or abandoned you, your life is still precious and don't let anyone tell you that it isn't. Your situation that you're currently in, oftentimes, whenever we're not in an ideal situation, we, we feel like, well, we're less than, less than someone else. Don't think that for a moment. All life is precious in the eyes of God, and I believe in the eyes of God's people. Your life is precious. The third is this. We were created in God's image. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. You, you bear the image of God. You look like God. Think of this. You, you walk around as a... Don't you know that every demon in hell, every demonic spirit, sees the, the image and the likeness. You're made in the image of God. You, you bear about His, His reflection. I guarantee you there are some of you, you know, different ones have, have said uh, about our family, you know, uh, I'll, I'll see an old friend or, or I'll see somebody that knew dad and they'll say, oh, you look just like your dad. You know what? I got to be careful because they might think it's dad doing something. <laughs> What's he up to? Oh, that's not him. That's his boy. You know what? We got to be careful how we conduct ourselves because we're bearing the image of God. That you reflect the image of God here upon this earth. The, the last one is this. Number four is there is a plan for every person's life. No matter what you believe, no matter what you might be living today, we, we know from the book of Psalm, we just read it. It says, the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. The plan that God has for you were already written. All of the days of our lives were written. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah says it this. I know the plans I have for you. John, Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans that I have for you. They're, they're plans to bless you and prosper you. Man, I want in on that plan, don't you? I want, to, I want part of that one. I've lived this one. I want that one. I want what God has for me. You see, everything that God made, he made precious in his sight, and he also put within it his purpose. Our purpose. From the book of Ephesians, we, we go on and, and we when we talk about our purpose, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Again, notice that ordaining. You notice that, that those ways are prepared. Notice that it doesn't happen just by chance, that God gives opportunities and he puts in our path things that we are to walk in. God prepared in advance things for us to do. You were created not only as the handiwork of God, but you were created for good works. In other words, your life is to be producing good things. Beneficial things is another word, way of saying it. Things that would, that would bless and be of benefit. Whenever we, we think about our purpose in life, it's not to stir up trouble or to see how much, how much conflict we can raise. We, we've tried that one. Your life is to bring about good things. Do you realize that you have the capacity within you to bring about good things in your life? You have the capacity to bring about good products and good things. 
It's as simple as this. You know as well as I do that you can speak words and you can give acts of kindness and all of those things make an impact in people's lives. The very talents and the abilities that he has put within your hands, every one of them he has put together so that you could be of benefit to the world around you. Wow. You know what else? It says this, that, that in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, it says that I was created for his pleasure. Do you believe this? That, that God actually gets pleasure out of me? He smiles. I don't find that hard to believe. You know, I've got a, on my computer, I've got the, I've got that where, where when I don't do anything, it just sits on my desk. Every once in a while, the pictures will start appearing. If you don't have that, you ought to. It's wonderful. Because you'll get, well, maybe you shouldn't have it because I'll just sit there and stare at it for hours. No, I, not really, not really. But you could. And you know, I'll see the girls when they were little. Oh. Or I'll see it on a, on a trip or I'll see something that happened. And you know what? It, it inspires you. It, it reminds you of the preciousness and, and the joy. Don't you know that every time he looks down, he goes, oh, man, there's my kids. I was looking for Tara. There she is. Man, how are you doing today? Look, there's Gina. Oh, I wonder from heaven if the Lord just might be waving. I don't know. Okay, just, just I, I know. Uh, don't anybody write me a note. I know. No. Don't write me. It's okay. It's all right. I'll get back to platform here in a second. Simply put. God gets pleasure out of you. You were created to bring pleasure to God. As a matter of fact, your life was to bring pleasure to God. That means that within your life, you have the ability to bring pleasure, to bring honor, to, to, for God to delight in your way. So whenever we, we, we think of this, not only did he create us as precious, he also put within us his purpose. But you know what? We can see God's hand in our lives. God's hand in our lives. The, the, the scripture says it this way in the book of Philippians. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you. He started it. He did. He started it in me. He, he, he began a good work in you, is able to perform it, or able to bring it to completion in that day of Jesus Christ. Everything that the Lord has started in you. I know that this is what? January what? 18? Already probably some resolutions have fallen by the wayside. You know, we start things. We, we, we intend to do things. We make lists of things that we intend to do. We, we, we plan. We buy the kits. We do all the stuff. And, and we have a good intention. But the good news is this. that It says that God not only has good intentions and began the work and started it, but also is going to fin finish the work. He's not going to leave you, those models half done. He's not going to leave those projects on the workbench. He's going to perform it, complete it, and put it all together so so that it makes sense. He's able to complete it. You see, God in our life, many times we'll feel promptings. You know, the Lord told them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And, and, they, and they, they all got together and they decided they all liked to be together. And so, you know what? Persecution came and they went all over the world. Everything that happens, the Lord can get glory out of. What seemed to be trouble in the persecution was actually a blessing, and it actually sent the gospel throughout the, throughout the world. It sent the gospel throughout the nations of the world. When we read on, we understand that it's God that works in us both to will and to do his good pleasure, Philippians 2.13. In other words, God's working out his will. He says, I will give you the desires of your heart. We do his good pleasure. It's kind of like, like Norm you know, on, on, uh, on this old house. Have you ever seen Norm? I love to watch Norm, or is it Yankee Workshop or something? Anyway, do you know whenever he does those things, he makes it look so easy. He makes me believe I can do it. He's got all those parts, and he goes, all you got to do is just make this little jig. I try to make the jig, and the jig's crooked, you know? I, I don't know. But Norm fits it together. All you need is this perfect clamp that's the right size. All you need... It's easy. Anyone can do this. You can even get the plans for this one. Man, I can do that. You know, the wonderful thing about it is that we're not the builders God is. 
We're simply the raw materials, and the Lord fits together. That's why sometimes the Lord brings about people and connections so that he can piece together his plan and his purpose. Now, now we, we understand that just like, just like Norm can stick it all together, he can, he can do that, and the Lord does it so seamlessly and perfectly. As a matter of fact, the, the Ephesians goes on to say in another place, that another epistle says that it's his power that is at work in us. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we would ask or think according to the power that's at work in us. In other words, God's grace and power enable us to do things that we normally could not do. It, it, it's his power that, that enables us and gives us that, that, that ability Sometimes the, you were called on to do things that we think that there's no way that we could possibly do. i got to remind you that the Lord knows how to give grace to you. In other words, knows how to enable you to do things that, that otherwise wouldn't be possible. Even our steps, the Scripture says, are ordered by the Lord. He delights in our way. The, the Scripture goes on, and in another place it says that all things work together for our good. How can he do that? It's because God, the master builder, is putting all the pieces of the puzzle together if we will yield to him. We sang it before, I surrender all. I hope that wasn't just a song. I hope that was your dedication. Lord, all that I am, I give to you. You see... If God's work seems to be stalled in your life, maybe you, you feel like that things are being held back. Sometimes it's God's timing. You remember a guy by the name of Joseph in the scripture? What God had planned for Joseph took a long way around. He went into the pit, he went into the prison, he went into the palace. You know, God's timing has to be perfect. Sometimes the Lord has to temper us. In other words, he's got a plan for us, and he's got a place that he wants us to be. The book of Deuteronomy, it says this way. It says it this way. He says, I took you through the wilderness to know what was in your heart. He's talking about the Israelites. He had to take them around the, around the bin a few times to temper their spirit. In other words, to get them to a place where they could follow the Lord. Not, the most important thing, though, is not only his timing and his tempering, but is also just putting our trust in him. Putting our trust in him, just saying, Lord, I trust you with my life. If we want to see God's hand fully, fully extended in our life, if we want to see the full product of what he desires to do, we must yield to him. So how do I continue that pursuit in the book of the book of Second uh, Peter, it gives us just a, a little glimpse of a of a passage of scripture that, that tells us maybe some pursuits that we can put on. It's Two Peter chapter one, it says it this way. He said, Be, beside all this, give diligence to add to your faith. Add to your faith. That's your persuasion, your moral conviction, your, your trust and reliance in God. Add to that virtue. Virtue is another, just another word that we use for excellence. It's that word that it means it's, it's valor, it's perfect, it's, it's excellent. And to that, add knowledge. Knowledge is a, an experiential understanding of what God can do. And to knowledge, add temperance. Temperance is just self-control. And to temperance, add patience. Patience. There's something we need. You know what that, that word really, I, I looked it up in the, in the lexicon. It means this, cheerful, cheerful or hopeful endurance, consistency, faithfulness. It says that your patience add godliness, godlikeness. Anything like God, I put that on. And then brotherly kindness, that's the word that we get Philadelphia. It's that brotherly love. It's that love for your brother's. It's that connection that you make. And they said to that, add charity, which is the word agape, which is God's love, unconditional love. It's that love that we, we love beyond and not love because of. You want to see God's hand in your life? Maybe it's stalled. These are some of the pursuits that you can give. Your firm faith in God, your firm belief, your firm diligence in, in following after these things, understanding God's will, God's ways, God's work. You see, I believe that God has his hand upon you. I believe that God has a special place for you. I believe that God has a special plan for your life. 
when you walk with that firm, firm confidence and that keen awareness, I believe it will make a difference in the decisions that you make. Should I go or shouldn't I? Well, let me see. How would it affect God? Should I do this? Should I enter into this one? How will it affect your relationship? Well, you know what? What about your friendships? What about the words you say? What about the lifestyle that you live? Every one of these things will affect either positively or negatively your relationship with God. Let me give you an illustration. Let me give you a case study. I want to talk to you about Caleb. Caleb. That's a guy that you don't doesn't come up in conversation. Caleb. Caleb, what does it take to fulfill God's plan in our lives? Caleb, I believe that he got a hold of what God had for him. Let me tell you the story of Caleb. Just in case you don't know, this is found in Numbers. It, the, the scriptures, the references are there on your, on your, in, your, in your scriptures. But let me just take you to Caleb. Because Caleb was one of, one of 12 spies. He, along with Joshua, were, were, were commissioned to go spy out the promised land. Well, they go and spy out the promised land. As a matter of fact, they bring back some grapes from this valley, and, and, and they're carrying these grapes. Of course, I don't know if they really, but anyway, they, they, what they looked like, but they must have been huge. They must have been a nice cluster. And so anyway, they're bringing back all of the fruit of the land, and they're telling. And so Moses, Aaron, bring them before, and they, all of the spies are there. And he said, well, tell us what you found. And, and don't you know, they, Caleb and Joshua, they're ready to go. Man, they flow with milk and honey. It was incredible. Look at the grapes. Look at the fruit. It was wonderful. And then the 10 spies tell their story. The other 10 say, man, there were giants in those lands. Don't you know those cities had these huge walls? There was no way we could possibly get over those walls. And don't you know the people? We were like grasshoppers. We looked like, we looked like little, little toys, little grasshoppers in their sight. These people were huge. You're talking about exaggeration. Have you ever told a story and exaggerated just so it would make you look better? Okay, they weren't really, gr- there wasn't really that kind of, but they were, they were buttering it up a little bit. You know, they were adding to, they're giving a little evangelistic report there. How many were saved? Oh, thousands, multiplied thousands, hands all over the building. What happened was, Caleb and Joshua, they told, we can, we're well able to go in. Well, they get the people all, all stirred up. Well, then all of the ten, other ten spies get the people all depressed. Oh, man, we can, boy, what are you doing? We, we should have just died in the wilderness. We, you should have never have taken us out of, out of Egypt, Moses. I can't believe you messed us up. We had a good thing going there. We were getting beat once a day whether we needed it or not. It was wonderful. Why did you ever bring us to this horrid place? They're going to kill us. They forgot. They seemed to think that Egypt was a desirable place. You know what? so much so? They got so angry that they were ready to stone Moses and Aaron. They were ready to, to knock them down. And don't you know, about that time Moses and Aaron fell on their face, God's glory showed up, thank God. Otherwise, they would have been dead. God's glory showed up. Everybody kind of dropped their rocks. Then God said these words. Okay, everybody over 20 years old, that's one day you do not want to have your 20th birthday. Everybody over 20 is going to die. I'm going to get rid of that generation that won't believe me, except for I'm going to keep Caleb. So everybody over, so all the 19-year-olds are going, thank God. (laughs) Yeah. Boy, these old codgers, they don't know what they're doing. And So Moses and Aaron, and and then there are two other old guys, Joshua and Caleb. Do you realize that they were more than they were over 20 years older than everybody else when they came into the promised land? They were more than 20. Now, I don't know if there's any 85-year-olds here, but Caleb was 85 years old before he ever received the fulfillment of all that God had for him. 85 years old. Did you get a hold of that? Some of you are, are pressing 60 and think, man, God's finished with me. Not a chance. 
You see, God is able to fulfill even when you're, when you're pressing that terrible number of 50, Stephanie. <laughs> she just had a birthday. We, it's okay. Everybody knows it. It's not secret. Everybody's going to go by and say, happy birthday, Steph. <laughs> you missed it already. Keep those cards. In, as long as they bring gifts, you don't mind, do you? Okay. What I'm here to tell you is this. Age does not matter. God doesn't see or care about gray hairs. He counts every hair of your head, but he doesn't care about that. What he does care about is this, that he's got a perfect plan for you and he's got a place for you and he's got a powerful, powerful life that he wants to give you. Now, now let's go. Why is it? How is it? Write these down on the bottom of your paper. I want you to see these things because I believe that if we're going to fulfill God's plan for our life, if we're going to see God's hand in our life, this is what we see in the life of Caleb. Are you ready? Look at the bottom of your paper and write these words. Number one is this, not being influenced by the, by the crowd. Stop letting people tell you what you ought to be doing. God is the one that should influence your life above everything else. If they would have listened to the crowd, you know what? They would have been part of the, the bones that were scattered in the wilderness. Like everybody else of their generation. But there was a, a, a generation, a, a remnant of that generation of Caleb and Joshua that said, you know what? We, we're going to follow God no matter what. And those were the ones that received the very promise of God. I believe, I don't care what your, the rest of your generations do. They can, they can still, you know, hang up their bell bottoms or not. You know, it doesn't make any difference. You're going to go on with God. Don't be influenced by the crowd. Don't let other people tell you your abilities. Well, you ought to retire. Well, you ought to get... Re Don't you know you're old? It says that Caleb had another spirit. He had another spirit. He holy... And, and, and he followed God. He, he allowed his faith to overcome even the fear of people. And, and success in life is, is this. It's... it's by not allowing the crowds to influence your opinion. Number two is this. He wholly followed the Lord. It means completely holy. This is the kind of holiness that we need. Because when you wholly follow the Lord, that God's holiness, I believe, will be radiating in your life. When you follow the Lord and your whole, only pursuit is to follow him and to, to do his, his will, fulfilling his commission, fulfilling your call, fulfilling your, your desire to please God, wholly following the Lord. That means every day, not just when you feel like it or when you feel spiritual. Every day. Not just on Sundays. Number three is this. He kept the promise alive. He kept the promise alive. He kept the promise alive. You know what? We need to keep the promises alive in our life. These are the promises that God said, I will never leave you or forsake you. These are the promises that says, lo, I am with you always. These are the promises that tell me that no weapon formed against me will prosper. These are the promises that tell me that by his stripes I'm healed. These are the promises that, that, that tell me that greater is he that is in me, that, that I can cast all my care upon him. I keep the promises alive. It keeps me young. It keeps life flowing in my body. Let's go to the last one. It's this. Personal inconvenience. Well, count me out. I, you had me, Mark. I was going to go with you, but... All that means is you don't get your way. All the time. It means this. 85 years old, Caleb had to fight the battles. Mark, I'll tell you what, I just have a hard time getting out of that lazy boy. <laughs> Caleb was ready to fight. He, you know what he said? He said, I'm as strong today as I was back then. I'm ready to go. Point me at him. I guarantee you those enemies, you know, those giants weren't going to say, hey, come and kill me next, Caleb. You had to go chase them down. He went after him, though, and it's his own inconvenience. He said, you know what? I'm going to go because this is what God has for me. 
Give me that land. Give me that mountain that the Lord promised me. I'm going after it. And it says from that day forward, even in today, that, that the, the land of Hebron is still belongs to Caleb. I believe that God ordains places and ordains his plan and his purpose in your life so that we can fulfill what he has for us. Pursue him. Wholly follow him. Be influenced not by the crowd, but by him alone. And I believe that we will fulfill what God has for us in our lives. Would you stand with me? Jesus' name, Jesus' name. I want to do this. I want to pray this a different, just kind of a different way. I want to do this. I simply want to pray this, and, and I, I really feel like if there's if there are folks here today that you know in your heart of hearts that there's more for you, that you have been kind of letting up. You know who you are. We're not going to take roll and point and, because I guarantee you, to one, one extent or another, every one of us probably fall into that category. But there's some here today that you know that you're living not like you could be. You know in your heart of hearts that there are things that you've come up against and you've allowed in your life that never should have been there. You, you knew and you never intended to go that far. As others just have stopped, got tired, got weary. All the battle's not worth it. Man, I'm tired. I believe God wants you to enjoy the fullness of his life. He said, I've come that you might have life and life abundantly. Say, Mark, my life is anything but abundant. Today, I want to pray for you. I'm not going to point out because, you know what, that, that does little value. I simply want to just, if, that, if you, that's your desire, if it's your desire, I want you just to lift a hand to the Lord and say, Lord, that's me, as we pray right now in Jesus' name. Lord, all across this building, I pray that the supernatural power of your spirit would be upon every one of these lives. I pray that you would anoint them for your pursuits. I pray that you would put in them a keen awareness that you have called them and have destined them, have, have created them as, as in your very image, have put your purpose and ordained their life. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would give grace, give grace to those deficiencies. Give your power, Lord God, for the weaknesses. I pray that you would just reveal yourself again. Lord, I pray that we would walk in your timing. That you would temper our hearts and spirits. Most of all, that we would trust you. I pray that not one of these would be influenced by the crowd, but rather that they would be called to a higher place. I pray that not one of these would, 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 would uh, hold back, but rather would wholly follow you. I pray in Jesus' name that you would just inspire, strengthen as we make our commitments to you. We give you all glory and praise. God, for every fault and failure, we know that your word says if we confess, you, you forgive us and you, Lord, I thank you that you, you just cleanse us and you clean us up. And Lord, I thank you that we're accepted because of your grace. Lord, I just praise you and thank you for that. Now be with each one, we pray, in each home and each family. May we pursue you like we never have before. May we see the double portion of your spirit upon these, your people. We give you glory and praise for that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everyone said amen.